Welcome to this first in the series on atomic theory. We'll begin by looking at things isotopes, atoms, and ions. Throughout this series of programs, I'm going to do a little bit on the nature of science, a little bit of atomic theory on how the development of the model happened. In this first program, I'll take the work of Dalton up to the work of Chadwick. As I said, I mentioned, I'll start with the work of Dalton. Dalton was actually an English teacher, and he, by studying the work of chemistry, came across several ideas related to atomism, which had been around since uh, the time of Democritus. It was belief that if you divided matter into small enough bits, you would end up with individual pieces called atoms. Each of his atoms was unique, meaning that each atom had its own unique set of properties. Atoms were indivisible. Atoms of one element were all identical to each other. Here below his picture, you see some of the symbols he used to represent atoms. His model of the atom is sometimes called the billiard ball model of the atom. These billiard balls would essentially group together in small conglomerates called molecules. So carbon dioxide, for instance, was made of an atom of carbon with two identical atoms of oxygen attached to it. Later on in the turn of the century, around the 1900s, J.J. Thompson was studying the emanation of particles that came from the cathode or the negative terminal and streamed towards the positive terminal. Using a magnetic field, he was able to deduce that these particles that came out of the cathode possessed a negative charge. He theorized they originated inside of an atom. So his model of the atom was sometimes called the raisin bun model, where the raisins would be represented by small negative bits he called electrons stuck in a positive dough. Rutherford did a little bit further work on this particular model in around the 1911. By firing what he called um, alpha particles, newly discovered radiation, at these raisin buns, he found that most of them went through, which wasn't surprising, but occasionally one would bounce back. And this proposed a problem. Why would one bounce back? If all of the atoms were like raisin buns, they should either all pass through or none should pass through. What he theorized was that the positive charge of the atom resided in the core, or the nucleus, of the atom, and he led to the development of the nuclear atom. Later, the work of the scientist Chadwick in the 1930s deduced another particle also resided in the nucleus, and that was called the neutron. This leads to what we sometimes call the, the beehive model of the atom, where the hive would essentially result in what's called the nucleus, and the bees would be the electrons buzzing around outside. So to summarize what we've got so far, we have the proton and neutron, which make up most of the mass of the atom, residing in the nucleus. The electron, which weighs but a small fraction of the mass of the atom, resides outside the nucleus. I'd like to introduce now something called atomic notation. First of all, X represents the symbol of a chemical element. C for carbon, O for oxygen, Cu. Uh, representing copper. The top number is sometimes called the mass number, and it represents the total number of particles that are in the nucleus. Remember that the neutrons and protons make up most of the mass of the atom, so you can think of that number as the total number of protons and neutrons put together. The lower number, Z here, represents what we call the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the element. The number of protons identify what the element is. Let's look at an example. <clears throat> Li I can represent, no represents lithium. The three tells me there's three protons that are present. And being a neutral atom, it would also contain three electrons. Now to deduce the number of neutrons, knowing that there are seven particles in the nucleus, three of them protons, I can deduce then that there must be four neutrons. Here's a picture then of what that atom would look like. Notice the nucleus here is somewhat over-exaggerated in size, would be a small fraction of what is shown here. Let's take a look at the term isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element with different masses. This would be contrary to what Dalton would believe. Dalton believed that all atoms of an element were identical. The presence of isotopes indicates that he's wrong on this account. Atoms of copper, for instance, although they both possess 29 protons, can have differing number of neutrons, which result in different masses. So, as I mentioned here, I have two isotopes of copper. 
one with uh, essentially 34 neutrons in it and the other one with 36 neutrons in it. Because they contain the same number of protons and electrons, there's no difference in their chemical properties. But there are differences in their physical properties, in particular density, whereas the one with 36 neutrons would be somewhat denser, containing more mass per unit volume. The relative atomic mass is an average mass of the atoms that takes into account how often each of the isotopes occurs, sometimes what is called the natural occurrence. In nature, 69% of the time, copper exists in the 63 form and 30.8% of the time in the 65 form. My average needs to reflect those abundances. So to determine what's called the average relative mass, I multiply each percentage by converting it first into a decimal times the mass of that isotope. Here we can see that comes out to 63.6. It's important to note that no single atom of copper weighs 63.6. This number is simply reflects how often each of the two isotopes occur. Some atoms may have more than two isotopes. When you look at an element in your periodic table, as you'll often see the information presented as shown here. The top number, the 29, tells me the number of protons and the number of electrons in a neutral atom. The number that's written beneath copper represents a weighted average of the isotopes of carbon. So here, 63.55 just contains more significant digits and used greater accuracy in the percentages that I used in my calculation. When an atom gains electrons, it becomes negative and forms what we call an ion. In particular, when it gains electrons, we call it an anion. So here I have chlorine. The difference between these two is the number of electrons. Normally, chlorine with 17 protons has 17 electrons. The gaining of one electron causes it to have more electrons than protons, and hence a negative one charge. When an atom loses electrons, it forms a cation. Again, here we'll go through an example. Copper normally has 29 protons, hence 29 electrons. If it loses two of its electrons and has only 27, it develops a two plus charge. One of the things I use to remember anion and cation and differentiating them from each other is the presence of the T resembles a positive charge. So I know cations represent things with positive charges. Let's take a look at another example. Here I have an aluminum ion. The 13 tells me right away that there are 13 protons present. With 27 particles in the nucleus, 13 of which are protons, I know that there must be 14 neutrons present. And finally, the 3 plus, normally it has 13 electrons. The fact that it's 3 plus indicates that it's lost 3 electrons and as a result, possesses only 10. So this program serves as an introduction, as I said, to atomic theory. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to post. Thanks for watching.